Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you very much for the study of your word. We thank you for the opportunity you've granted us to be in your presence and to read your word and to apply the word to our lives. We know that of all things we can do in life, this is the greatest of all. Because this is where we're prepared to meet you on the final day. We're praying, O oh Lord, that your spirit will open the pages of scripture and grant us understanding as we study your word today in Jesus' name. We pray that it will not just be a formal study like religious people gathering together for religion, but Lord will come with her heart, will come with her mind, with her heart open to your word. We pray, O oh Lord, you'll teach us by your spirit in Jesus' name. And we pray, O oh Lord, whatever you need to cleanse and remove from our lives, you'll do it by your grace, by the cleansing of the blood, by the sword of the Spirit, which is your word, you'll cut off everything that ought not to be in our lives. In Jesus' name, help us to be receptive. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We continue with our study of the word of God. And we are studying from Hebrews, from um, James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Today we're looking at just one verse of scripture. We find it in verse 17. James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Here we find one of the definitions and descriptions of sin in the scripture. Actually, as you will expect, there is much said in Scripture concerning sin. The reason for that is because when Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, and the Lord gave them a commandment of what to do and what not to do, they soon rebelled against the Word of God, and they sinned against the Lord. Of course, the Lord knew that man will rebel and man will sin, and therefore he made a provision whereby we'll have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was from that time that God revealed that the Redeemer will come. And eventually Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross of Calvary so that He'll take away our sins. Our sins will be forgiven. And then we'll have the privilege of coming back out of the wilderness of sin and come back into the fellowship with the Lord. But many people do not really realize the depth, the height, the scope, the extent of the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord went through before he saved us. And the reason they do not make much about their freedom from sin or deliverance from sin is because they do not really fully understand the description and the definition of sin given in the Bible. And as we come to such a study tonight, you need to open your mind and open your heart and open your ears and open your eyes to you and look at the word of God so you will understand what the Lord wants us to understand. Without an understanding of the word of God concerning sin, you will not really fully appreciate justification by faith. Neither will you understand and appreciate conversion, total change, reformation, transformation. Neither will you understand the, the message, the doctrine of holiness and sanctification. In fact, it's known from Bible days and it's known in contemporary times that those who have a low or defective view of sin will generally have a low understanding of salvation and low appreciation of the Savior. Their misconception of what sin is will make them to call a deadly evil a small thing. In fact, you find among such people, they minimize the gravity of the danger of the judgment of their sins. But then the Bible is telling us what sin is. And as the Bible tells us what sin is, it gives us two kinds of branches of sin. It gives us uh, two descriptions of sin. That is what is called outward sin. There is the sin of commission. That's what people commit. That's what people do. That's what people practice. On the other hand, there is the sin of omission. That's what people don't do. That's what they refuse to do. There are many people that only concentrate on one branch. 
the sins they commit. And they do not realize there are many, many sins uh, they, have, they have not done which they should have done, which translates to mean uh, the sin of omission. In Romans chapter 7, you find a description or definition of both the sin of commission and the sin of omission. Please open your Bible. Romans chapter 7. We're reading from verse 15. In Romans chapter 7 verse 15 it says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If you analyze and try to interpret to understand those uh, things said in that verse, you will see he says there are things he does which he shouldn't do. That means the sin of commission. And then there are things he should do which he is not doing. That's the sin of omission. In verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Lord that it is good. He says, I do that. I practice that. I commit that which I shouldn't do. That's the sin of commission. You come to verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but to perform that which is good, I find not. He says, I'm missing out on something. I want to perform. I want to do it. And I cannot do it. I'm not doing it. I am omitting something that is so necessary, indispensable for me to do. That's the sin of omission. Verse 19, for the good I would, I do not. He's still repeating it and telling us. He's telling us it's not only what you do that constitutes sin. It is even what you do not do. And then he says in the latter part of verse 19, But the evil which I would not, that I do. He says, I practice it, I do it, I commit it, is a sin of commission. So you find according to what we have read now and studied in the word of God, there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. The sin actually according to the Bible is very quick to do evil. Those are the sins of commission. His feet run to evil. And then there are times he doesn't know the good thing that he ought to do. Those are the sins of omission. If you look at Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. There in verse 17. You'll see what we're talking about very clearly. As the Bible gives us understanding that you examine your life, you look at what you are doing, and you will find there are things you are doing which you ought not to be doing, which means the sins of commission. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17. Here it tells us, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord. Though he wished it not, he knew it not, yet is he guilty, he shall bear his iniquity. Here he tells us it's a sin of commission. His soul sins, he commits these things that are forbidden and they should not be done. The commandment of God says don't do it and you do it. That's a sin of commission. Come on to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. You'll find what Jesus told the Pharisees. He told them, you are guilty all around. You are guilty on this side. You are guilty on the other side too. You are guilty because of the sins of commission. And you are guilty because of the sins of omission. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. In this verse 23 here, Jesus Christ said, Woe unto you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why did he say that? For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and uh, cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. He said, You think you are right because of the things you are doing. And you think that your religion, because it has a lot of things, activities that you are going through, you think you are right, but you have omitted some things. And in saying that you omitted some things, he said, they are even the weightier matters of the law. Justice, judgment, or mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. On the authority of the words of Jesus Christ, therefore you understand, 
there are sins of omission, there are sins of commission. These things you should have done, and you have not done them because of omitted them, because of forgotten to do them, because you have not really done everything you ought to do, you have committed the sins of omission. In James chapter 4, for verse 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, he knows the commandments of God. He knows the requirements of God. He knows the thing that the Lord has laid upon him as responsibility, assignment, and duty. But he has not done them, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The three points we are going to quickly look at. Number one, the definition of the sins of commission. The definition of the sins of commission. Number two, the description of the sins of omission. The description of the sins of omission. And then number three, deliverance from sins through conversion. Number one, the definition of the sins of commission. This is so very important because if we're not free from our sins, if we're not saved from our sins, if our sins are not forgiven, we cannot have fellowship with the Lord. But the sins cannot be forgiven if we do not confess the sins and forsake the sins. But we cannot confess and forsake if we don't even know what sin is. We'll be thinking we're all right when we're all wrong. We'll be thinking we're righteous when we're unrighteous. We'll be thinking we're free when we're full of sin. That's the reason it's very, very important for somebody who wants to have fellowship with the Lord, somebody who wants to make heaven his home at last, that he will know what does the Bible say about sin? What's the picture the Lord gives us about sin? What are the things that the Lord has said? This is wrong. This should not be done. And then we're doing them. It's when you know the definition, the description, the thing that the Lord has said. This is not right. And then you're doing it. Then you know you are not upright. You know you are not righteous. You know you are not a child of God. You know you are still in sin. And you know that you need a Savior that will save you and cleanse you and remove you from all your sins. Let's see, therefore, what the Lord is saying about the definition of sins of commission. Look at the Bible in First John. First John chapter 3 verse 4. First John chapter 3 verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. Here the word of God says very clearly what sin is. It doesn't leave you or leave me to evolve or to develop or to cop out a definition of our own. Because if you are allowed to give a definition, your definition might be different from mine. And my definition may be different from his own definition. And because of that, your definition may actually say you are right. Because your definition shows that you have a defective idea, understanding of sin. But we come back to the scriptures. We come back to the truth. And we come back to what the Lord himself is saying. And then when you see the definition of the Lord, and you know that you have not done according to the will of the Lord, then you know that you have committed sin. How does he define sin? He tells us whosoever. He's talking about the common people. He's talking about the rulers too. He's talking about the men. He's talking about the women too. He's talking about the small. He's talking about the great. He's talking about whosoever. Whosoever committed sin, transgresses, also the law. He says it's the same definition for everybody. You don't have a definition. I have a separate definition. Whosoever committed sin is transgressing the law. Why? How? Because sin is a transgression of the law. That's a general thing for everybody. But man in his ignorance and depravity, he makes light of sin. And he calls evil good. And he calls good evil. Man's understanding of sin is so perverted that he will excuse the sin that will damn his soul. And he will say, is it not a small thing? I, do I not have a reason for doing what I'm doing? Man is so deceived and man is so depraved, he will justify sin. And he will deceive himself until he perishes in sin. But here we are told that sin is missing the mark of God's righteous standard. When God lays a standard 
And he says, this is the way, this is his will, and this is what he lays down in his word. And then you go against that, you contradict that, and, and you, uh, you transgress, you go over the line, the limit he has said. The Bible says, that is sin. In uh, Psalm 51, Psalm 51, verse 4, here the psalmist, having sinned himself, while he was confessing the sin, he made it very clear that he understood what sin was. And in his understanding, we get some understanding too in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He gives us the description and definition of the sin of commission. He said, it is evil. But he said he did it. He said he practiced it. He said he did something he shouldn't have done. Something that the word of God commands against. And then he says he has done that evil in the sight of the Lord. You know that God is omnipresent. Whatever you do, anytime, anywhere, God sees you. And therefore everything you have done, you have done it in his sight. In 1 Samuel First Samuel chapter 15 verse 23. In First Samuel chapter 15 verse 23, here's Saul talking to uh, Samuel talking to Saul and letting Saul know that he had gone astray. He had done something he shouldn't have done. In short, he had committed sin. That is, he had gotten involved or the sin of commission. For Samuel chapter 15. Verse 23, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected thee from being king. He, he didn't only tell him of the, of the uh, definition of sin, he also told him of the consequence of the sin that he committed. But the definition, first of all, he said it's rebellion. When we know that this is what God has said, and because of our rebellion, because of our heart to disobey and disregard the will of God, and we just feel, I will do what I will do, no matter what the word of God says, that's rebellion. And then it says, it is even stubbornness. When we know that this is the way to follow, and we still say, our self-will will take over, will override the will of God, it says that stubbornness is a sin. But then uh, the, the, the frightening sin, the fearful sin, the terrifying sin, is that he compares it with what we know to be very deadly and very evil. He says that that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. There are many people that will not think of joining witches and wizards, or for preaching sorcery and witchcraft, but that will be rebellious. But they do not know that in the sight of God, rebellion and witchcraft, they are in the same class. Stubbornness and iniquity and idolatry, they are in the same group and in the same cage. And the one, and if uh, somebody is judged for one, then is judged for the other as well. And so you understand from the things we have read in the Word of God that number one, sin is missing the mark of God's righteousness. Number two, sin is living in willful, open defiance of God's law. When God makes the law and He says, this is what you do, and then you defy that. I damn the consequence. I will do what I will do. I'm not under the control of anyone. Not even under the control of the word of God. You defy the authority of God and the authority of the word of God. That's sin. Number three, sin is breaking and disobeying the word of God. In word, in deed, and in thought. When you know the word of God, and then you overstep the boundary. And you do what you shouldn't do. And you go where you shouldn't go. And you say what you shouldn't say. When you break the word of God, you disobey the word of God. And you say, no, I disregard the word of God. I will do whatever I want to do. I don't want to be under the authority, under the control of the word of God. That's sin. Number four, when you live contrary to the commandments of God, according to the word of God, you should go this right direction. 
And then you turn around, you turn your back on the word of God. And the opposite of the word of God is what you do. And you are living and walking and talking contrary, acting contrary to the commandments of God. That's sin. Number five, when you rebel against God's authority, is your creator. And if you claim to be saved, is your redeemer. And therefore he has authority over you. One, by creation. Two, by redemption. But then when you say, I will not allow him to rule over me. I will not be under his authority. I will not be under his control. I'll go my own way. I'm the master of my ship. I'm the captain of my soul. And nobody will direct me or control me by anything in any way. That's a sin. Number six, sin is influencing others to disobey God. And to rebel against God. When you, have not, when you are not even satisfied alone by doing evil. And then you have to get other people along with you to do that evil thing with you. Then it means that you are not walking according to the way of righteousness. It means that you are disregarding the word of God. You are disobeying God. It means you are living in sin and you are influencing other people to sin with you as well. Man has gone so far in committing sin and living in sin that it will take the grace of God and the power of God to be able to bring him back. In Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 9. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, here we find the whole catalog and the whole list of sins given. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Paul the apostle was talking to the Jews here. He's saying, are we Jews better than they Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we are before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin, under the control of sin. When you come off the control of God, you come under the control of sin. As it is written in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that, that seeketh after God. They may be religious, they may go to church. They're not seeking God. They may be seeking for some blessings or prosperity and healing and other things, but they're not really seeking to serve the Lord. And then it tells us in verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. They all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Here the, the, the writer is telling us, the inspired writer Paul the Apostle tells us that man is so deep in sin, he'll commit sin with the eyes, or the leaves, or the mouth, or the throat, or the thought, or the heart, or the hands, or the feet. Every part of him is yielded to sinning. And then he tells us in verse 15, their feet are sweet to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. It tells us the reason why men commit sin. Why they do evil. Why they do the thing they shouldn't do. Why they walk contrary to the law of God. To the way of the Lord. Is because the law or the fear of God is not in their heart. They don't fear God. They don't respect God. They don't honor God. If they honored God. If they feared God. They wouldn't do what the Lord didn't want them to do. And then we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the consequence of committing sin, that is, if you disregard the word of God, if you go against the word of God, it's what contrary to the law of the Lord. It has consequence here in the life that now is and in the life which is to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, no idolaters, no adulterers, no the effeminate. The effeminate are the men that want to have an air cut like that of the women. And they want to dress like the women. They look sissy and they look silly. It says the effeminate and the abusers of themselves as mankind. Those are the people involved with uh, homosexuality. And then no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers. 
the revilers are the people that they will despise a good thing. They will despise sound doctrine. They will despise the word of God. They will make jest and joke about the things that are serious in the kingdom of God. They revile. They revile the word of God. They revile the ways of God. They revile everything that God holds precious. And then it says, no extortioners, the people that will like to make unlawful gain from other people. It says, no, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In um, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, reading there from verse 8. It tells us what sins are. And it tells us that if those things are in your life, you better check up in time and you better go to Calvary in time. You better dip yourself in the fountain of the blood of Jesus so that you can be cleansed, so that you can be forgiven, so that your life can be turned around, you become a new creature in Christ. Otherwise, if a death comes and meets you in the, in the, in the midst of the pollution of your sin, you'll die and go to a place you didn't bargain for. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and uh, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Well, you see what the word of God is saying here. It's telling us what sins are. And it's telling us the people who do them, they are the people that uh, practice the sins of commission. You understand now what sin is? Sin is breaking the commandments of the Lord. What's the commandments of the Lord? It says, worship the Lord, honor the Lord, and fear Him. When you don't do that, you commit sin. It says you keep yourselves away from idol. Little children, keep yourselves away from idol. When you relegate the word of God to the background, you say, no, that's not for me, and you worship idol, that's sin. It says you honor the Lord, you reverence the name of the Lord. And when you take the name of God in vain, you swear by that name, you joke with that name, you jest with that name, you do not reverence God as the Lord has commanded, that's sin. It says forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but you will make sure that you are with the children of God, you congregate with them, you fellowship with them. When you don't do that, and you abandon the fellowship of the children of God, and you go to your business, and go to this, and go to that, that sin. The word of God tells us in the New Testament, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And when you do not obey your parents and the Lord, not only your natural parents, you do not obey uh, your teachers in the word of God, your leaders in the word of God. And you think that you are wiser than the people that are leading you in the way of righteousness. Not a sin. Honor your father, honor your mother, and so that your days will be long on the earth that the Lord has given you. You see, when you do not obey those commandments of God, and you go aside, and you contradict, and you, you do what is not right, you're living in sin. The word of God says you shouldn't kill. In fact, the New Testament says you will not hurt anyone. Do no violence to any man. And when you disregard that word of God, and you are not obeying the word of God, you are living in sin. It says, flee fornication. Let not fornication, adultery, uncleanness, immorality be once named among you. And when there is fornication there, when there is immorality there, people may not know, but God knows. He sees your heart. He sees your life. You are living in sin. Doesn't the New Testament say, him that still stole, let him steal no more. Doesn't it say, defraud not one another in any matter. If you are stealing then, pilfering then, it means you are, st you are sinning. Because the commandment of God is there. You close your eyes against the commandments of God. You have nothing to do with the commandments of God. Another commandment says, lie not one to another. Because you are members one of another. And when you lie to other people, you deceive people, the Bible says you speak the truth in your heart. The truth is there in your heart. You refuse to bring it out. What comes out of your mouth is lying and deception. That is sin. And doesn't the Bible say you will not covet anything belonging to your neighbor, his wife, his house, anything belonging to your neighbor. And it says, let not covetousness be once named among you in Philippians, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 4. Then when you are contradicting those words of God, it means that you are living in sin. What do you do to be saved? To be saved from sin and to come into fellowship with Christ. You repent from all your sins. 
that means you'll turn away from all those sins. You confess and forsake. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You pray and pray in faith until all those sins are forgiven. And the Spirit of God bears witness with your heart that your sins are forgiven, your life is changed, your heart is transformed, and now you're on the path of righteousness and you're able to live a life that glorifies the Lord. But then we go to point number two now, the description of the sins of omission. The description of the sins of omission in James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He knows to do good. He knows the right way. He knows the right thing to do. He knows because his conscience bears witness with him. This is the right thing. Because the Holy Spirit instructs him and leads him. This is the thing to do. Because he read it in the word of God. This is the way of the Lord. And because his neighbors and his friends and his Christian companions have told him, this is the right thing. But then he knows the right thing to do. He has been instructed as to the right thing to do. But no, he will not do it. That is the sin of omission. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus Christ speaking here, and for to make people understand, what is the depth and the height, the length and the breadth of what the Bible calls sin? In Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 47, Luke 12, verse 47, And that servant which knew it is not will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That servant that knew his Lord's will. And many of us who are here, this may not be your first time of coming to the Bible study. Even if this were your first time of coming to the Bible study, you've read the Bible before you came here. Living in society, you know some basic things that uh, we shouldn't do. And the basic things that we should do, then it says, that servant that knows the mind of his master, the will of his master, the commandment of his master, and then he omits what he ought to do. And he refuses to do what he ought to do. He has sinned, and because of that, he will be beaten with many strides. What if he doesn't know? What if he's ignorant? Verse 48 tells us, but he that knoweth not, and did according to this, uh, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. He tells us that if you happen to have been ignorant, you have no excuse to be ignorant because the Bible is there for you to read. The church is there for you to come. And you are there, you can be taught the word of God. And so, even if you didn't know and you did things worthy of the judgment of God, you will still be judged. Let's see some examples and illustrations and descriptions of the sin of omission. Meaning things that people ought to have done and they didn't do. And they left doing right. They forgot doing right. They didn't do what good thing they knew they ought to do. We became sins of omission to them. In Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verses 3 and 4. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Why? Because of the sins of omission. Because of some good things they should have done which they didn't do. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out. You will see then from the word of God that those who know to do right and they didn't do that right thing 
The Bible counts it as sin to them, sin of omission. In Luke chapter 10, verses 30, 31, and 32. Luke chapter 10, we're reading from verse 30. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30, hear the parable that Jesus told. And very clearly there, you will see the illustration and description of the sins of omission. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He should have saved a life. He didn't do it. He should have done good. There was opportunity for him to do good to that person that had uh, his life almost gone, but he didn't do it. In verse 32, and likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and he passed by to you on the other side. And so you find that those are sins of omission. Well, as you look at the word of God, you find a lot of commandments that the Lord has uh, told us that this is the positive thing to do, active thing to do, to be a blessing to the lives of other people. And when we refuse to do those things, they become sins of omission to each of us. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 23, which we read earlier. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 23. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What did they omit? He tells us one by one. Number one, judgment. That means justice. Although they might say they were not stealing, they were not committing adultery, they were not doing those negative, negative things, the sins of the flesh, but there were some important things, weighty things. They ought to do, they were not doing. And it became a sin of omission to them. Number two is mercy. When they ought to show mercy, they didn't show mercy. When they ought to demonstrate manifest love, they didn't demonstrate manifest love. It was a sin of omission. And then he talks about faith. Very important. Without faith, we cannot please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But because they wouldn't believe, it became a sin of omission. And Jesus said, these you should have done. You didn't do them. You have sinned. As we look at the New Testament, and as we examine the New Testament and match what we read with our lives, we will see that we too were guilty for a committing or for having sins of omission in our lives. For example, the Word of God says in Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Here is the word of God telling us very clearly, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. If you are not showing mercy then, you have opportunity to show mercy, but you didn't show mercy, you omitted something, which are matters of the law. It means that you have sinned, because you have not done what you ought to do. Another thing we notice from the word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the latter part of verse 13. Here it says, in the word of God, in that latter part of verse 13, and be at peace among yourselves. And when you are not at peace among yourselves, and you are not uh, encouraging peace in the midst of the children of God, of course you are sinning. And it is a sin of omission. It says, follow peace with all men. And yet you will not do anything, you will not make any effort to keep the bond of peace and unity together in the midst of the children of God. You are sinning. Have you, been, have you yielded yourself to water baptism since you were born again? Because the word of God commands us, it says you must be baptized in water. 
And if you have not been baptized in water, it's not enough to say, praise the Lord, I'm coming to church, praise the Lord, no adultery, praise the Lord, no fornication, no drinking anymore. The question is, you are not obeying uh, the word of God fully. Why are you not obeying the word of God fully? Isn't that a sin of omission on your part? In, in uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. Every one of you. If you have repented, if you have been born again, and you have not been baptized in water, that's a sin. It's a sin of omission. There's something the Lord told you to do, and you have not done it, and you are then sinning against the Lord. In John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's a positive commandment of the Lord. And remember what Jesus said. He told those Pharisees and those scribes, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And if you uh, are going through all the motions of religion, but there's no love in the heart. There's no love in the family. There's no love to one another. You do things you want to do without considering how that might be a manifestation not of love, but for the opposite of love towards your brother, towards your sister. Of course, you are still sinning. And if sin is there, the sin of omission, which is a weighty sin, you are not loving one another. You are not really going the way of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Here the Lord was telling the people that you do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And whenever you go against that word of God and you do not do unto others the way you want them to do unto you, it means you are sinning. It says in Matthew 7 verse 12, Therefore, all things, not some things, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do even so, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Do you see the way we ought to act? You are seeing from the word of God now. It's more than, thank God I don't drink. Then thank God I don't smoke. Uh, those, are, those things are all right. It's good that you are not smoking. It's good that you are not drinking. Are you very thoughtful when you act to other people? As you relate to other people, are you very thoughtful? Are there some weighty things, important things you are leaving undone? When it says before you act, before you do anything, consider your brother, consider your sister, consider your wife, consider your husband, consider your children, consider your parents, what you want them to do unto you. If you are in their situation, that's exactly what you ought to do to them. In uh, Hebrews chapter 13. We came here to study the Bible. Open your Bible. We need to study. In Hebrews chapter 13, reading there from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. Be content with what you have. That's the word of God. And whenever we are not uh, accepting that word of God, we are not abiding by that word of God, there is a sin of omission somewhere in your life when you are not uh, keeping to the word of God. And then uh, we are told in the word of God that we should be patient towards all men. We have been talking about that for a long time now. Have you learned that? Are you patient with your wife now? Are you more patient with your husband now? Are you more patient in the service now? Are you more patient with a preacher now? Be patient towards all men that you find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, number 8. It says that you will set your affections on things above. Set your affections on things above not on things on the earth. And then it says, submit one to another in the fear of God. In um, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. 
There are many people that think they are going to heaven and they'll be disappointed terribly on that final day. They think they have omitted, they think they have uh, done everything the Lord wanted them to do. But they will understand on the final day there are some positive things, practical things, important things, indispensable things that the Lord wanted them to do, which they were not doing. And this is one of them. You find many people today that they call themselves children of God. They are the first to profess and to proclaim they are born again. They are the first to say they are children of God. And if you check up their lives, you'll find submission is missing. They will not even submit to the leadership of the church, not to talk of submitting to uh, their own fellow brothers and fellow sisters. And that's the sin of omission on your part. It says in that verse 21, submit. That's the word of God. We cannot cut it away from our Bible. And no matter even everybody is rebelling, that doesn't justify sin. Sin is still sin in the sight of God. And it says in that verse 21, submit yourselves one to another. How do you do that? You do it in the fear of God. And if we're not submitting one to another, and there is uh, no respect for anybody, we don't know who is pastor, we don't know his leader, we don't know he's the teacher of the word of God, we relate with everybody as seed, we need to step on them and push them down, you'll be surprised that the Lord will judge and say, you've lost your Christian life because of the sin of omission. In First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. He tells us to be closed with humility. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Here in the word of God, he tells us likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject unto another. Be closed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. We we'll see them from the word of God very clearly that there are commandments, positive commandments of the Lord. And if we do not do them, then the Lord finally will judge us that we have committed the sins of omission. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me. Ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? What have they done? Look at verse 42. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. You, you have seen very clearly from the word of God, that the word of God teaches that there are sins of commission, there are sins of omission. But then what are we to do? How can we be free? How can we get free from all these sins? That leads us to point number three. Deliverance from the sins, all the sins, whether of commission or of omission, through conversion. Man on his own is helpless. It is struggle against sin. Struggle and resist as he may. He cannot overcome all his sins on his own. Neither can he live a victorious life in his own strength. But we do not need to lose hope of winning the victory. Because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And to set us free from our sins. The power in his atonement can break the hold of sin on anyone. He saves and he sets free. That's the uniform testimony of the scriptures in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Here is what the angel said when talking about Jesus. He said, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. If you have met the Lord, he would have saved you from your sins. If you have not been saved from your sins, maybe you are in religion, but you have not met the Lord, you are not in Christ yet. When we come to Christ, that's what he does for us. You turn away from the sins, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you allow the blood that is shed on the cross of Calvary to wash you whiter than snow, 
and then he makes you free from your sin. In John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When you really meet the Lord, he'll take away all the sins in your life. None will remain. There will be no disobedience there. There will be no rebellion there. There will be no stubbornness there. There will be no witchcraft or sorcery there. There will be no evil sin anymore. You meet the Lord and he takes all the sins away. The Bible tells us that his blood will wash all the stains of sin. Wash everything away. Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. That's redemption from sin, the removal of sin. But if that is going to take place, you have to be sincere. And you have to confess those sins to the Lord. Get rid of them. Remove them from your life as much as you can. And then ask for the mercy of God that he will give you the grace and the strength and the power not to continue in them. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. A time comes in your life when you realize that sin does not pay. You might have enjoyed it when you did it, but the judgment of God will be following close after you. And when you come to that conviction that sin does not pay, then you want to totally turn away from them, wash you then, and make you clean. That means you've been dead in the sight of the Lord. And He wants a change in your life. He says, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes and cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. That's justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. And plead for the widows. Then he says, come now. And let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, willing to repent, obedient to do what the Lord is telling you to do, and you are willing to bury the rebellion and bury the disobedience and bury all the transgressions and all the sin in your life. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if there is no repentance, then there will be no forgiveness, there will be no change of life. Uh, as I made allusion to it before, David, it came to a time in David's life when he committed sin. He did what he shouldn't have done. When he wanted forgiveness from the Lord, cleansing from the Lord, he had to pray. That's the same thing you will have to do also. If you want forgiveness, or want cleansing, or want the real salvation of the Lord, you don't just want to be a churchgoer. You don't want to just to be a religious fellow. You want the grace of God in your life. You will have to pray. In uh, Psalm 51, Psalm 51, reading from verse 7, Purge me, he prayed with his soul. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. That will be your prayer. You realize something is wrong. You realize you are not walking the way of the Lord. You realize your life is not in conformity with the word of God. Touch me, he said, with his soap. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from mine sins and blot out all mine iniquities creating me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me. That's the prayer the sinner will have to pray. Maybe you are there today and you are saying, well it's a good study and I've seen all the word of God. In my own case I think I am alright. Before you jump to a conclusion uh, look at Numbers chapter, Leviticus chapter 4. In Leviticus chapter 4, here we learn that there are people that may not be right with God, but they may be ignorant about it. 
And the Lord makes it very clear that you are ignorant of your offense. You are ignorant of the condemnation. You are ignorant of the evil things you have done. Doesn't uh, justify anyone. Look at it, Leviticus chapter 4 from verse 1. Leviticus chapter 4 verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, here it says, anyone, if he so sin, but he sins through ignorance. He said, well, I didn't even know it was wrong. I thought I was doing right. I thought that was a good thing to do. Yet, the Lord counts it as sin. Once the word of God is against it, once the light of scripture shows us it is something that ought not to be done, then that individual is guilty. Verse 13 of that same chapter if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance that the whole congregation is doing something doesn't justify it, that you have half of the congregation, that you have many people among the workers doing something, that doesn't justify it. If it is wrong, it is wrong. If the word of God goes against it, the word of God is against it. Even if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the sin be hid from the eyes of the assembly. They have not read the Bible to that point. They have not seen the teaching of the word of God to that point. And the sin they have done, the whole congregation is seeding from their eyes. And they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which should not be done. They are guilty. In verse 14, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. You're learning something here today. You might see a lot of uh, people around you, members of the church, uh, they're doing something. And then you are wondering, I thought, uh, you know, they said this is not good. I thought they said this is not righteous. But this is doing it, that one is doing it, that one is doing it. Then you say, maybe after all, the thing is not wrong. If it were wrong, some leaders and some workers and some members will not be doing it. My friend, that doesn't justify sin. The whole congregation... The whole assembly may do it. If it is wrong, it is still wrong. We're told in verse 20 of that uh, same chapter, And he shall do with the bullock, as he did with the bullock of his sin offering. So shall he do with this. The priest shall make atonement for them, and he shall be forgiven them until there is atonement. There will not be forgiveness. And therefore, if you have joined the multitude to do evil, the things we've been hearing over and over from the pulpit here, that that thing is not right. You shouldn't do it. And you persist in doing it. And other people have joined you. And the other people that are coming in are joining. And they're doing it. And say, I don't even feel guilty. Maybe you're ignorant about it. And you don't feel guilty. Your guilt is still heavy in the sight of God. Verse 22. When a ruler has sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning the things which should not be done and is guilty. A person may be a ruler, may be a leader, may be a worker in the church and through ignorance maybe has no time to read the Bible. Maybe he hears the word of God, he didn't pay attention. And yet, if you do it, it is still wrong in the sight of God. In verse 23, or if is sin, wherein he has sinned, come to his knowledge. The sin may come to your knowledge today or one day. He shall bring his sin, his offering, a kid. He shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, and make an email without blemish. In verse 27, and if 
any one of the common people seen through ignorance. You see there, it talks about the whole congregation. It talks about the ruler. And it talks about any one of the common people that will do something through ignorance. While he doeth some word against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done. And be guilty. And if he sin, which he has seen, come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish, for his sin which he has sinned. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. The latter part of verse 35 tells us the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he has committed and it shall be forgiven him. We have been very clear today concerning what the Bible is teaching us and we need to examine our lives and find out are we actually worshipping God acceptably? Are we still really born again? Are we still free from sin? Are we living righteously? Or are we playing with sin? Are we joking with sin? Are we doing things we shouldn't be doing? Are we living undone things we should do? Are we still serious about going to heaven? Or has the sin become just religion? Are we only coming here just to come? Have we become like other churches? The way I see things and the way I see people, it's like many people are wasting their time and they are wasting their lives, and they are playing with sin, and they do not understand that this is the thing that nailed Jesus to the cross, and the Lord is telling us that he's coming very soon, and if the Lord shall come, and then it is when he comes, all the people of God are gone, and then there will be a lot of people remaining behind, and then you are not able to go with the Lord, and then you remember what you have learned, you say, I die known, then I will have called upon the name of the Lord at the right time, this is the time for you to call on the name of the Lord. Check up your life. Forget about other people. Forget about what they are doing. If other people are not serious, you leave them alone and be serious. If other people don't want to go to heaven, leave them alone and uh, make right your way. If other people want to continue in sin, if other people want to continue in rebellion, if other people want to, uh, they know what is right and they will not do what is right, leave them alone and you call on the name of the Lord. And make sure that you call to the, on the name of the Lord to the point you know you are born again. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that your life has changed. And you know that uh, things he's telling you to do, you are committing your life to do them. Everybody rise up. Those who are sitting down, rise up. Please have a right attitude. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. That many people are doing it to are joining them, that's not an excuse. I saw a worker doing it, that's not an excuse. I didn't know it was wrong, that's not an excuse. I thought it's a small insignificant thing, that's not an excuse. Sin is sin. Rebellion is sin. Disobedience to the word of God is sin. Disregarding leadership and going the way we want, doing whatever we want, a sin. You may realize too late, realize today. If you are not born again, from what we are studying from the word of God, you know that you are still a servant of sin. This will be the time to confess your sins and to forsake them. Let him forgive you. Let him change your life. Salvation is the greatest gift you can get from the Lord. When you are saved, you'll be happy to live right. You'll be happy to walk right. You'll be happy to go in the right direction. You'll be happy to do the will of God. You'll be happy somebody is revealing to you the word of God, the mind of God. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. 